My name is Mark Pilger. I'm president and owner of SIP Corporation. And we're actually the oldest manufacturer of real grinders in the United States. Been doing it since 1902. Question for you. Is today's golf course technician's job more or less difficult than it was 25 years ago? Who thinks it's less difficult? Who thinks it's more difficult? My God, you're a smart group. <laughs> it's more difficult because the equipment today is more complicated, right? But also, it's the, you're having to deal with things like lower height to cut and modern cutting units, which require much tighter tolerances. Petition amongst courses, there's less rounds of golf being played, so you have to have a better quality course uh, to, to attract as many golfers as you can and as many rounds of golf as you can. And today's budgets, when I first started in the business, the budgets were controlled by the superintendent. He was given a capital equipment budget, he was given an operating budget, and he could spend within that budget, he was fine. Today, that doesn't happen anymore. You've got all kinds of committees and, and oversight that doesn't allow you to spend it, and if, if there's any way they can cut that budget on you, they're going to. In addition to that, the golfers that play on your course have much higher expectations. They all want to be playing at, uh, at Augusta, right? So that means that you have to get better conditions on your course. And that, again, we talked about it, lower height to cut. Okay, that means faster greens. And you're going to have more play, hopefully. Uh, you all send up, the superintendent wants to do more aeration, more top dressing, and more frequent mowing. That means that you have to do more with less. And so what we're here to do is talk about the grinding part of it and how we can get more for less with the grinding. And we have a concept we call total parallel grinding. And it's five things you want to do when you're grinding your reels. First and most obvious is, anybody? Sharpen? Okay. You want to be able to add relief if necessary. You want to grind the reel and the bed knife straight. You want to grind the reel in a cylindrical, get rid of the cone shape and you want to grind the bottom of the reel parallel to the bottom of the rollers. Of those five, three need to be done within a certain parameter. Okay, Straight, cylindrical, and parallel. Now, 25 years ago, you could grind a reel straight to 10,000 and you'd be fine because you're going to probably lap, back lap it in get everything running true on it, right? And you can get them cylindrical within a 32nd of an inch or 30 thousandths and you were fine because you had all kinds of adjustments on the old cutting units. And parallel, that basically has a, it ties in with whatever your height to cut is. You're really trying to get your uh, height to cut within 10% of, of, of being true. So if you're cutting a, a quarter of an inch, 25 thousandths out of parallel, you're still fine. What do we have to do today? Well, today, you're trying to eliminate back lapping in most cases, so you're trying to run, you got to get your reel and your bed knife true to within a thousandth of an inch. Because of the adjustments on today's cutting units, you, they require you to get the reel cylindrical within seven to ten thousandths of an inch. Toro, uh, John Deere, they say ten. Jacobson says seven. And you want to get the bottom of the reel parallel to the bottom of the roller, again to within ten percent of your height to cut. And I'm, I'm sure most of you are cutting at an eighth of an inch or less, right? So that means that you have to have that bottom of that reel parallel to the bottom of that roller within ten thousandths of an inch. So you can see the tolerances that we have today are, are significantly tighter than the tolerances you would have had 25 or 30 years ago. So again what we do with, the with our system with the total parallel grinding, we again will grind straight to within a thousandth of an inch. Everybody should be able to do that. Again that eliminates the need for backlapping. Anytime you have more than a two or three thousandths gap between the reel and the bed knife, what's it going to do? It's going to start tearing instead of cutting, right? So you need to make sure you have less than a two thousandths gap anywhere along the bed knife. And if you're running light contact, that means that if the reel is straight within a thousandths and your bed knife is straight within a thousandths, there's never going to be any place where the gap is going to be greater than two thousandths of an inch. Okay? We'll grind cylindrical within two thousandths of an inch. Again, the requirements are seven to ten. We can do it within two. And finally, grinding the bottom of the reel parallel to the bottom of the roller. Again, we're going to do that within two thousandths of an inch. Well, let's go into a little history of our company. This is um, the original grinder, the very first commercially viable grinder ever made. It was built in 1902. And in looking at it, 
I, I wish I had brought the other picture with me, but if you're looking at it, you're kind of thinking that maybe it stands about this high with a hand wheel up here, right? I found a guy who's got one somewhere in Florida. I haven't been able to get it and see it, but this machine here, the top of the hand wheel stands about this high. And so the whole mechanism is down here. And it was originally designed, again, for homeowners' mowers. To, you know, so you, the local hardware store or the blacksmith or whatever would buy one of these machines, put it in there, and a homeowner could bring his mower by. He'd sit it up there and grind it. And the way it would work is, and you may be familiar with this, you've got this, slot, this spinning shaft right here. That spinning shaft is driven by this sprocket and chain, which is then driven by this large sprocket. Okay? And you'll notice that's hand-operated. The guy's going to stand there and crank it like this. That's how he's going to do his grinding. Okay. On that hub, on that sliding shaft, you've got a, a sliding hub. On the spinning shaft, you've got the sliding hub with a grind, grinding wheel mounted on it. So the grinding wheel is going to go back and forth like this to do the grinding. And down here, you've got your two auto in, or, or your two dual end in feeds to in feed it as you're trying to do your grinding. Uh, this one is a, obviously a relief grinder. It developed the first finger guide, which is right there. And so you would get your finger guide on one side of the blade, the stone on the other side of the blade. You'd set it up. And then across the top here, you've got a feed screw that you can engage and disengage. So what you would do is you would get everything set up, engage the feed screw, come over here, crank this around, and that would spin the wheel and pull the grinding handle across automatically. When it got to this end, you disengage the, the feed, bring it back to this end, feed it to the next blade, engage everything, and crank it again and feed it across. Now, again, that was the original one built in 1902. But by 1910, we realized there was a serious flaw in this whole design. And that flaw was by mounting the grinding wheel on that spinning shaft and sliding hub, there was clearance and slop for it to be able to slide freely. So in order to get rid of that, that slop, what they did is they kept the sliding hub here or, and spinning shaft, but on the hub they put a secondary sprocket. And then they did a chain drive to a separate bearing onto which the grinding wheel was mounted. And that eliminated the problem of the grinding wheel hopping and chattering and, and not being uh, real precise. Again, it's still hand operated, as you can see here, but they added the ability to do a belt drive on it. Okay? And that would have been powered by steam or even in some cases a horse carousel. You'd have a, a horse going round and round and turning a, turning a post, and that would drive another post, which would drive gears and all this type of thing. Very complicated, but that, that's how it worked. By the 1930s, we, we decided that. You know, electric motors are now commonly available. We can drive it without steam and without a horse. And so an electric motor was added. But you can see it was added here as sort of an afterthought. It took the place of that big flat leather belt. This grinder is actually a peerless grinder. Um, and the peerless grinders actually developed in 1910 and on up were more for the commercial or golf courses, where the ideal grinders were more for the homeowners. Not that the homeowners would own them, but for the homeowners type of lawnmower. And we actually have one of these grinders still in use up in Vermont. Uh, this is a 1937 Peerless grinder on a nine hole course. And every winter he takes all his reels in. And you can see there, there's the electric motor that's been added onto it. And I can't talk him into buying a new one. <laughs> and I was going to give him a really good trade in on that one. Um, by the 1940s, we realized that the spinning shaft was just a bad idea altogether, so we eliminated it, mounted the grinding wheel right on the carriage, and then uh, by the 1960s, we realized that you didn't want to have to reach over the top of the grinder to grind, reach over the top of the, the cutting unit to grab the grinding wheel and pull it back and forth, so we developed a suspension style grinder in which the operator stands on the same side as the grinding head. By the 1980s, we the spin grinders came into uh, production, and this is our spin grinder. Uh, it's basically the same grinder as you saw on the previous slide, but it's added the, the automatic carriage travel, the spin motor, and all those things you need to make it automatic. The problem with this type of grinder is that you're doing, it was fine when you're doing relief grinding, which is a continuous cut going back and forth, and it didn't take much beating. But by, when you start doing spin grinding on something like this, all of a sudden you have an, what we call an interrupted cut, or you've got that grinding wheel banging against the real blade, now there's all kinds of vibration that can be in, introduced into it. And even with all the extra bracing and everything put on it, it still was not, uh, would not maintain the precision and would vibrate too much. So we came up with, in the 1990s, our first tabletop grinder, uh, and this was the original Peerless 2000. Actually, that's the, that's the original prototype 
of the Peerless 2000. We call it the 1999. The other aspect of, of doing the relief, uh, doing the precision grinding is how you measure the reel, how you set the reel up to begin with. In the beginning, we had developed all the way back on that 1902 grinder, uh, a shaft that looks something like this, where you just have a shaft here mounted in a bracket with a stop on it, and you'd adjust that stop so that the shaft would be sitting against the reel shaft. Okay? Then you'd go back and forth and you'd adjust the reel until it was touching that, that shaft equally on both ends. By the 1980s, we added a dial indicator to it to make it a little more precise and easier to read. And then when I developed the, the uh, original 2000, we came up with our, what we call our dual dial indicator bracket, which allowed you to measure both ends of the reel shaft at the same time, okay? making it a lot easier to do. Now, what's the problem with all that? Anybody have any guesses, any comments? Well, that, yeah, that is one of the problems. That's absolutely true. But that's not the problem I'm looking for. What about the real shaft? This is a brand new John Deere unit. And I don't say this to, to face John Deere. They all have the same thing. But you can actually see that real shaft wobble up and down. Right? You can all see that. And what will happen here is I'm going to run this line on the bottom part of the wobble. And then we'll go up to the top part of the wobble. And when you measure that, that reel shaft is out by 60 thousandths of an inch. How are you going to measure your reel and get it cylindrical with less than 10 thousandths of an inch if you're having to do it off of something that can vary by as much as 60 thousandths of an inch? You can't. The average reel shaft will vary by 10 to 20 thousandths of an inch. And what that means is if you're measuring off that reel shaft, you have less than a 50% chance of getting that reel ground into specifications, the seven to 10 thousands that the manufacturers require. Okay? If you take the shaft that we saw, which was out by 60 thousands of an inch, you've got less than a 10% chance. Depending on where on the, on the reel shaft that you measure it, you have less than a 10% chance of grinding that reel to the proper specifications. So, what do we have to do in order to be able to grind the reels and get them running true and according to the manufacturer's specifications. Well, what we do is we start off with an all welded steel table. It's then precision machined so that the top of the table is going to be parallel to the grinding head track shafts within less than two thousandths of an inch. Those two surfaces are, are fixed and permanent. What that means is that that grinding wheel is going to travel parallel to the top of the table again within less than two thousandths of an inch. And of course what that is going to mean, uh, a result in, is that the bottom of the reel is going to be ground parallel to the top of the table within two thousandths of an inch. Since there's no adjustment on it, there's no variations in it, it's just going to do that. So the trick is what we have to do instead of adjusting the grinder to the cutting unit, we adjust the cutting unit to the grinder. Okay? And to be able to do that, we have to be able to measure the reel precisely. Measuring off the reel shaft doesn't work, so what we do is we use a pie tape. And the way it works, and you can go online and get the, the same video to show you how it works anytime you want. Uh, there's also instructions in there. But you paste the pie tape magnet on the, on the reel blade, and you want to make sure the magnet is back far enough away from the edge of the reel so that it doesn't stick out. With, the, with one hand on the pie tape and the other hand on the reel, you rotate the reel around and bring it so it's as straight as possible and as tight as possible and you line up the edge of the pie tape with the line on the vernier. Okay? And then what you're going to do is you want to read the last number before the zero. And In this case the last big number before the zero is four so that's four inches. The last small number before the zero is six so that's six tenths or six hundred thousandths. And then the last small line without a number is, is the zero so there's no, there's no number there. So if we read that it's four inches six hundred and then we read the vernier on the right, the two lines that line up the best, and in this case it's an eight. So the reading of the pie tape on the left side of this reel is four inches, six hundred and eight thousandths, or just six hundred and eight. Okay? And then you go in and you'll do the same thing on the other side, the other end of the reel, and wrap it around, keeping it tight and straight. Uh, you can never get it too tight, and you can never get it too straight. If you get a smaller reading, it's because you've got it tighter or straighter, and that's the better reading. So here we have four inches, six hundred, this time the 25 thousandths line is, the, is red, and then the 3 thousandths line on the vernier. That gives us a reading of 4 inches 628. So 
628 thousandths versus 608 thousandths. This particular reel has a cone shape of 20 thousandths in it. Okay? We'll then go ahead and use the front rollers on the top of the table. Uh, and using the grinding head, we'll adjust that front roller until we get that reel shaft running true to the top of the table. And when we do that, we get the front roller, the rear roller, and the reel shaft all running parallel. And again, within two thousandths of an inch. And that will mean that you are going to grind your reel cylindrical within two thousandths of an inch, as well as parallel and straight. Now, think about this for a second. If I take that cutting unit off that grinder, what happens to all those adjustments? Anybody? Stays with the cutting unit, right? So what would happen if I put that cutting unit back up on there? Still, still should be adjusted, right? So those adjustments are going to stay with the cutting unit. So that means that when I go through my cutting units the first time and I do all those adjustments with the pie tapes on it, I can go out and mow with it for a couple of weeks. And if I want to do a touch-up grind on it, this is what a touch-up grind looks like. So we have a timer down here that'll start just as soon as he sets the cutting unit on the grinder. He's checking to see if there's any rock in the reel. If there's no rock in the reel, he knows that those rollers have maintained their adjustment. He then goes in and he's going to loop his chain clamps onto some part of the reel frame. Turn the clamps on, and that clamps the whole frame down onto the tabletop. You're not just clamping onto the rollers. Okay. Now he's going in and checking the reel. He wants to make sure that the reel touches pretty evenly all the way across, usually within two or three thousandths. Uh, again, depending how long it is, as much as five thousandths. As long as it's close, he knows nothing else has been misadjusted on it, and he's ready to go. Uh, now he's finally, the last thing he's doing is hooking up the spin motor shaft to the end of the reel, shutting the door, and you can see you can, you're set up and ready to grind in less than a minute. Okay? So now he turns the grinding motor on, the reel drive motor on, sets the speed, turns the carriage on, and I usually in-feed it after I start it, but he, he does it before he starts it. And you can see in looking at that, he's getting nice even sparks on that thing all the way across. Right. So now, again, just to, in all fairness, this particular cutting unit would be like the second cutting unit in the batch. So your fence position is already set, your travel stops are set, your spin motor position is set and it's on the right side. But even at that, even setting all those things up, it should only take a few minutes on that first cutting unit. The worst case is when you, in some cases where you have to drive from one side of the, of the cutting unit and then some of them you have to drive from the other side, so you have to move the spin motor from one side to the other. Well, our spin motor is automatic, is smart wired, so it automatically reverses direction, and that still only takes a couple of minutes. Just be aware that you get all your right-hand drives and your left-hand drives together so you're not switching back and forth all the time. Give it one last in feed. Let it go back and forth. Now this particular course actually had uh, 72 holes of golf that they serviced with one set of these machines and they would drive all their cutting units at least once every two or three weeks. Once that's done, you t open the door, uh, turn everything off, open the door, disengage your spin motor, remove the chain clamps, and remove the cutting unit, and you can see you can do a touch-up grind, typically two to three minutes. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention.